You ready? Wait. <laughs> you have to be ready for the introduction. Uh, so Charlotte has just submitted her PhD thesis on the rhetoric of the commentary and Derrida's double text. So congratulations to you. Um, she is also one of the founding editors of GLAD, exclamation point, a francophone journal devoted to gender, sexualities, and language. So please join me in welcoming Charlotte. have noted, uh, while Kaufman refers abundantly to Derrida, Sarah Kaufman, as a corpus and as a proper name, is not as visible as one could expect in Derrida. <laughs> Jeanette Michaud, in the book she recently published with Isabelle Lunaire, looked back on this old dissymmetry. Commenting on plusieurs absences notoires du côté de Derrida, qui ne rappellent pas les travaux de Kaufman aussi souvent qu'on aurait pu s'y attendre, she points to many of the research questions the two philosophers have in common. La femme, le babélisme des langues et la traduction, la représentation et l'imitation, la métaphore, l'écriture autobiographique. Jeanette Michaud lists several examples of Derrida's odd silences regarding Kaufman's work. So she just reminded you of them, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, Apori does not refer to comment s'en sortir. Qu'est-ce qu'une traduction relevante does not cite conversion, uh, conversion pardon. Uh, and after um, Duncan Marge's paper yesterday, uh, Jeanette Michaud formulated the hypothesis that uh, actually Derrida, far from just ignoring Kaufman's work, is reiterating his own, um, uh, I mean, he's reiterating Kaufman's reading of uh, Le Marchand de Venise by not uh, drawing attention to Jessica's conversion. Um, and finally, Amber Aswa, that comments on Freud, uh, Freud's conference on femininity, but does not acknowledge Hoffman's extensive commentary of it, include uh, Elenigme de la Femme, nor does it refer to Kaufman's analysis of Derrida's uh, work in Nature. When Sarah Kaufman's work actually appears in Derrida's text, the reconnaissance de debt is never straightforward, always oblique, as Penelope literature uh, has brilliantly shown, and here I take the liberty to refer to a, a great article on this question. Lastly, we cannot ignore Derrida's uh, homage to Kaufman. As you all know now, this text remained untitled. Uh, this is surprising, given Derrida's obsession with proper names, and here we can think of Sin uh, Eponge, or Acheté pour la vie, uh, with uh, Hélène Sixou, or again uh, of Demeure, Maurice Blanchot, Le Toucher, Jean-Luc Nancy, Chibolette pour Paul Célan, Mémoire pour Paul Demont. So, for all these reasons, I've considered that Sarah Kaufman as a cited corpus and as a readable, decipherable proper name was missing from the Rita's text. Now, here, my, here is my hypothesis that Sarah Kaufman is missing from Derrida's work just like woman is missing from it. <coughs> I thus propose to articulate the erasure of Sarah Kaufman to the erasure of woman in Derrida's text. My argument is threefold. First, I argue that Derrida's instrumental use of woman leads to its erasure. Then, I'll show that even when Derrida actually addresses woman, like in Nepal, for example, the reference to woman functions at the level of style and never at the level of ethos, if not of reference. And thirdly, I'll try to show that Derrida characterizes Kaufman as a very general woman. So first, I'll be looking into an old case uh, disputed by feminist critics in the 80s, uh, in which uh, uh, Christy MacDonald, Camus, uh, and Spivak. Uh, Derrida's use of words related to a woman's body in order to coin his undecidables, use that I characterize as erasing the feminine source, woman. Derrida explicitly conceives writing as a feminine technique. In Bla, he writes, le texte est la toison d'or, objet précieux, détaché par une sorte de scalp. L'écriture reste pudique parce qu'elle est prise dans une toison. À propos de pudeur, de tressage, de tissage et de foutrage, Freud propose un modèle naturel à la technique féminine du texte. Les poils, qui dissimulent les organes génitaux, et pour toucher la femme, le manque de pénis. In his lecture on femininity, Freud tells how women invented weaving from a natural model, their pubic hairs covering the absence of pins. Vous avez très mon accent allemand, donc je lirai la traduction de Anne Bermen que Derrida utilise. 
la pudeur, vertu qui passe pour être spécifiquement féminine et qui est en réalité bien plus conventionnelle qu'on pourrait croire, a eu pour but primitif, croyons-nous, de dissimuler la défectuosité des organes génitaux. Nous n'avons garde d'oublier que plus tard, elle a assumé d'autres fonctions encore. On pense que les femmes n'ont que faiblement contribué aux découvertes et aux inventions de l'histoire de la civilisation. Peut-être ont-elles cependant trouvé une technique, celle du tissage, du tressage. S'il en est vraiment ainsi, on est tenté de deviner le motif inconscient de cette invention. La nature elle-même aurait fourni le modèle d'une semblable copie en faisant pousser sur les organes génitaux les poils qui les masquent. Le progrès qui restait à faire était d'enlacer les fibres plantées dans la peau et qui ne formaient qu'une sorte de feutrage. Si vous qualifiez cette idée de fantaisiste, si vous pensez qu'en attribuant tant d'importance au rôle que joue dans la formation de la féminité le monde de pénis, je suis la proie d'une idée fixe et alors je reste désarmée. What do I draw from this? Uh, that there is a feminine technique, both in Freud and in their aspects. But women haven't invented anything. That's the paradox of Freud's lecture. When women finally seem to be given some credit, they, inven they invented one thing, they are in fact erased. What credit is there to invent something that already had a natural model? Moreover, more, moreover sorry, it is a lack of things that gave women the momentum needed to invent really. Women were then doubly taught by nature, and meant by nature, to invent weaving. Another way of saying that they did not invent anything, but just fulfilled their own biological destiny. When Derrida mentions this technique feminine, then, we can wonder whether the adjective refers to an active or to a passive role. Is the technique feminine because women invented it, or just because it's been invented by nature through the weaving of, of, through the weaving of feminine body? We find again our feminine technique in another of Freud's texts, heavily commented on by Derrida and Gla, fetishism. In this short article, Freud explains how the fetish is an ersatz for the penis the child saw the mother had, discovered she did not, and does not want to relinquish. First striking parallel with the lecture on femininity, women's lack of penis is awfully productive. It pushed women to invent weaving, and now it pushes the fetishes to, to create a penis substitute. What most interests Derrida in Freud's text resides in the analysis of a few very refined cases, the quatre raffinés, in which, je cite Derrida, la structure, la construction du fétiche, repose à la fois sur le déni et sur l'affirmation, l'assertion ou l'assomption de la castration. Here is Freud's text cited in Gla. Dans les quatre raffinés, c'est dans la construction même du fétiche, aussi bien le déni que l'affirmation de la castration ont trouvé accès. C'était le cas pour un homme dont le fétiche était une gaine pubienne qu'il pouvait aussi porter comme slip de bain. Cette pièce vestimentaire cachait absolument les organes génitaux et donc la différence entre les organes génitaux. Selon les documents d'analyse, cela signifiait aussi bien que la femme était châtrée ou qu'elle n'était pas châtrée, et cela permettait de surcroît de supposer la castration de l'homme, car toutes ces possibilités pouvaient parfaitement, là je coûte, se dissimuler derrière la gaine dont les gauches étaient la feuille de vigne ou une statue vivant l'enfance. Un tel fétiche, doublement noué à des contraires, est naturellement particulièrement solide. Second striking echo between femininity uh, and fetishism, the girdle. In German, it's called Schamgürtel, literally the girdle of shame. And the girdle thus points back towards the invention of women. Women wave their pubic hairs out of shame in order to conceal the defect of the sexual organs i.e. their lack of peace. The girdle and the weaving both serve the same purpose. But let's take a closer look at the reader's use of this message. He does not remark upon the similarities between femininity and fetishism. He does not comment on the reappropriation of a feminine invention by a man, the other fetishist. Instead, he draws attention to the fetish as something built up from two opposites, denial and affirmation of the mother's menstruation. In the end, Freud's text allows him to lay the groundwork to build the undecidable, the feminine fleece won't signal the place of the mother's castration, nor the place of the mother's phallus, but rather the place of the, the indecidability of the sexes. We can read the indecidable logic elaborating from Freud's text on fetishism in Gla, already at work in Derrida's commentary on Malarmé in La Double Séance. This is where he develops the quasi-concept of Imen, which, which I'd like to look at now. 
the Imen relates to women in quite a straightforward way, also that one would think. Imen relates to women because it designates a uh, part of women, of women, the membrane at the entrance of the vagina, and that is supposed to be pierced by the first penetrating intercourse. Derrida borrows the term to Malarmé, who uses it in mimic. La scène n'illustre que l'idée, pas une action effective. Dans un imen, d'où procède le rêve, vicieux mais sacré, entre le désir et l'accomplissement, la perpétration et son souvenir. Ici devançant, là remémorant, au futur, au passé, sous une apparence fausse de présent. Tel opère le mime, dont le jeu se borde à une allusion perpétuelle sans briser la glace. Il installe ainsi un milieu pur de fiction. The Imen stands entre le désir et l'accomplissement. As the strongest fetish stemmed from the contradictory belief in the mother's penis and in the mother's, and in the mother's castration, the Imen stands on the line between unfulfilled desire and accomplished penetrating sexual intercourse. As it also means marriage, the Imen is doubly between desire and its accomplishment. In Derrida's word, words, Imen signe d'abord la fusion, la consommation du mariage, l'identification des deux, la confusion entre les deux. Entre deux, il n'y a plus de différence mais d'identité. Dans cette fusion, il n'y a plus de distance entre le désir, attendre de la présence pleine qui devra venir le remplir, l'accomplir, et l'accomplissement de la présence, entre la distance et la non-distance. Plus de différence du désir à la satisfaction. From this difference, without any decidable cause, from this difference that is no longer working, Derrida draws a syntax. Ce qui compte ici, c'est la pratique formelle ou syntaxique qui le compose et le décompose. At this point in his commentary, Derrida transforms the imen into something syntactic, entre, even suggesting that the former, the imen, is dispensable. Par l'imen, on remarque seulement ce que la place du mot entre marque déjà et marquerait, même si le mot imen n'apparaissait pas. Le mot « entre », qu'il s'agisse de confusion ou d'intervalle « entre », porte donc toute la force de l'opération. Il faut déterminer l'hymen à partir de l'entre et non l'inverse. Well, hasn't Derrida been doing exactly the reverse all along, determining the « entre » from the « hymen » Here, he prefers the preposition « entre » to the noun « hymen » and thus he prefers a term irreducible to any reference to a word that could actually refer to women. Now, let me sum up my argument and the quick uh, journey we made into Derrida's work. When Derrida addresses something like the like woman in his work, it is in order to make it into an instrument of his writing. In order to coin several of his quasi concepts, Imen, but also in vagination, for example, he uses a technique acknowledged as feminine. First, the quasi concept is cut off from what made it feminine, then, it is autonomized as a preposition, entre, au revoir, pour. Um, or as, uh, sorry, it is made, it is autonomized as a preposition or as something impossible to link back to a reference. The erasure of women is as paired with the erasure of reference in the philosophy and writing of the reader. But one could argue that I'm purposely avoiding texts where Derrida addresses women. Epron, for example, where the philosopher famously announces la femme sera mon sujet. It is true that there, there are women and there are women and women in Derrida's work, but I, I'd argue that just like in them, they function as stylistic operators. Let's go back to the beginning of Epon. Le titre retenu pour cette séance aura été la question du style. Mais la femme sera mon sujet. Il restera à se demander si cela revient au même ou à l'autre. If Derrida endeavors to address women in Epon, he does so precisely when he's supposed to talk about style. Another hint that whatever we find that is related to women in Derrida's work also, and in the end, only relates to writing. Woman relates to style, but not to any style. Woman relates to a kind of non-serious writing, as she is always showed laughing. Gla rebounds with a feminine laughter, Antigone's laughter, for a start. She laughs because she knows her vanity is to struggle against the dialectical process. Rire de la sœur. Comme si elle savait qu'on ne peut pas mener ces mouvements d'emboutissement, le mouvement, le mouvement de la dialectique, euh, jusqu'à leurs extrémités. Mais le rire est aussi de la mer. Ce rire sourd, il n'éclate pas tout de suite. Et plus tard dans la scène, la dérision s'amplifie, une répercussion sans origine. But, but we don't always know why Antigone is laughing. 
like the mother's laugh, Antigone's laugh can also be without rhyme or reason. Deux frères ne peuvent se tenir en tête que se tuer, en tant que frères. Ce dont, mais non sans rire, meurt Antigone en sortant la dernière. Here we have yet another trope in the series of our Dirty and Women, the woman who dies laughing, because Antigone is not the only one who does. La double séance mentions at length all the different versions of l'histoire du Pierrot qui chatouille à sa femme et la fille de la sorte en riant rendre l'arme. Ce sont les verbes de Gauthier. But Colombine, uh, Pierrot's wife, once dead, uh, murdered by Pierrot, uh, who tickled her to death, um, Colombine comes back to haunt her murder with her laughter. Pierrot est repris incoerciblement par le chatouillement de Colombine comme un mal contagieux et vengeur. Il essaye d'y échapper par ce qu'il appelle un remède, la bouteille avec laquelle une autre scène érotique se conclut par un spasme et une pamoison. Après la seconde retombée, l'hallucination lui présente une Colombine animée dans son portrait, éclatandrée. Pierrot est repris par la trépidation et le chatouillement. Enfin, il meurt au pied de sa victime peinte, qui rit toujours. If Pierrot dies of tickling, just like Colombine, he is not showed laughing. Il, il est repris par la trépidation et le chatouillement, while she looks at him, laughing. What makes a woman laugh? Another scene in Gla may give us a clue. It quotes heavily from Jeunesse par avant. Quand Leila sort tous ses objets de dessous sa jupe dans la maison de la mère, Lampe, abat-jour, bout de verre cassé ou tesson, morceaux de verre, débris, éclats. Elle se fait demander par la mère Tout y est Léila, tout. La mère montrant le ventre bombé de Léila. Et ça Léila. Ça La mère. Qu'est-ce que c'est Léila riant. Mon petit dernier. La mère riant aussi. Où tu l'as eu Personne ne t'a vu Alors pose-le là. Elle indique un tabouret dessiné en trompe-l'œil sur le paravent. Leïla, à l'aide d'un fusain qu'elle a pris dans sa poche, dessine au-dessus de la table un rayon matin. Il est très joli. C'est quoi Du marbre ou de la galaïte Leïla a des fierté. Galaïte. What makes them laugh Here, it's Leïla simulating giving birth to another girl. But the scene does not only stage a fake delivery, it stages a fake delivery of a fake alarm clock, which exists only through a periphrasis, mon petit dernier, and then through a drawing. Needless to remind you that the imaginary alarm clock drawn on a blackboard is not marble, but galactite. Derrida comments, Toute cette matière galactique signe le top. Non seulement parce que cette substance est synthétique, mais parce que l'objet de bazar est seulement dessiné, et encore, en trompe et sur un paravent. Obsèque interminable de la chose même. Woman, in Derrida, is a provider of, of top. Laughing, she gives fake birth to a series of simulacra. Women is then the name of another relationship to choose that Derrida himself adopts as a style, as writer. Here, I'd like to go back to the beginning of La Double Séance, uh, at the end of a long polemical defensive footnote, where Derrida has reminded his readers of what he meant by écriture. We read. C'est donc un vieux mot et un vieux concept d'écriture, avec tout ce qui s'y investit, que des magazines de divers formats ont prétendu retourner contre cette critique, non sans lui emprunter toutefois, par confusion, quelques ressources. Ces réactions sont évidemment symptomatiques et elles répondent à un type. Freud raconte qu'au moment où il avait du mal à faire admettre la possibilité d'une hystérie masculine, il rencontra, parmi ses résistances primaires où ne se révèle pas seulement la sottise de la culture, celle d'un chirurgien qui lui dit expressément ceci. « Mais mon cher collègue, comment pouvez-vous dire de telles absurdités ?»« Hustérone, peut donc dire le virus ?»« Comment un homme peut-il être hystérique ?» L'exemple n'est pas insignifiant, mais on pourrait en citer d'autres. On a régulièrement opposé la prétendue origine d'un concept, ou l'étymologie imaginaire d'un mot, au processus de leur transformation, sans voir qu'on manie alors le signe vulgaire le plus surchargé d'histoire et de motivation inconsciente. Cette note, cette référence, le choix de cet exemple ne sont là que pour annoncer un certain déplacé du langage. Nous sommes ainsi introduits à ce qui est supposé se tenir derrière lui-même. Mystère, ou stérou, qui ne s'expose que par transfert et simulacre, par mimique. This passage demands several remarks. First, as the reader himself notes in these lines, l'exemple n'est pas insignifiant. Far from it. 
It tends to show that Derrida's writing has to be understood in relation to his sexual position, as if Derrida had to write like a woman. Secondly, we are here the confirmation that Derrida and all womanly things in Derrida are second-handed. Techniques derived from nature, like weaving, tuck, like the galactic alarm clock drawn on the blackboard of Leparama, or yet again, the imen and what's supposed to be veiled behind it. Lister ou Serou qui ne s'expose que par transfert et simulacre, par mimique. The imen does not cover anything. What's supposed to stand behind it actually only appears through a process of transfer and simulacrum or mime. The lack of origin that seems characteristic of women here, and maybe that's how a man can actually be hysteric, goes together with a stylistic process, un certain dépassé du langage. Derrida does not so much address women in his work and uses women to craft his own writing, a writing that is improper, improper, parodic, that functions through syntactical series rather than by referring back to an origin outside the text. I propose to read this use and efface and erasure of women in his work together with the text he wrote in homage to Kaufman, first published in the Cahiers du Griff, and now available in chaque fois et chaque fois. Let's turn now uh, to Derrida's text on Kaufman. My hypothesis is that in this text, Derrida characterizes Kaufman as a Derridian woman of sorts. Let's see how he presents his own hypothesis on Kaufman. Elle pleurait pour rire. Voilà ma thèse ou mon hypothèse. J'imagine que toute la méditation mise en œuvre dans son œuvre pourrait aussi ressembler à une grande songerie sur tout ce qu'on peut vouloir dire en français, tout ce que peut vouloir dire en français l'expression pour rire. Et pleurer pour rire. Depuis l'interprétation Nietzsche ou Freudienne du rire, au bord de l'angoisse, au bord des finalités conscientes et inconscientes du rire, de ce qui se fait pour rire, en vue du rire, en vertu du rire, en vertu de l'économie pulsionnelle ou apotropaïque du rire, j'y reviendrai à propos du mot d'esprit de Freud et du livre Pourquoi rit-on de Sarah Oui, pourquoi rit-on et pleure-t-on Jusqu'à la structure post-platonicienne ou non métaphysique de la fiction ou du simulacre, à savoir ce qui ne vaut que pour rire. Par exemple, le simulacre dans l'art et dans la littérature. From laughter to simulacrum, Derrida attributes to Kaufman the very features he attributes to women in his text. Actually, the phrase pour rire encapsulates the very function of femininity in Derrida's work. Women laugh and women fake. Everything she does is pour de rire. But we may risk another, um, we may risk further the analogy. Uh, as Derrida alludes to l'économie pulsionnelle ou apotropaïque du rire. This is, of course, a reference to Freud's Witz, but we can also read it with another intertext. In Gla, Derrida refers to Freud's text on Medusa's head, and commenting on the apotropaïque power of Medusa's head, conceived by Freud as a substitute for female genitals, Derrida doesn't fail to mention the end of Freud's text. Chez Rabelais, encore, le diable prend la fuite après que la femme lui a montré sa vulve. Summoning this comic scene, Derrida inscribes his text into a larger intertext. There is an apotropaic function to the female genitals that makes men run away and women laugh. This is the subject of Kaufman's essay on Bobo, a mythological character supposed to have helped Demeter out of her sadness at losing her daughter by showing her her vulva. To conclude, I'd like to draw a last parallel between Sarah Goffman and women in Derrida's work. Both are conceived in terms of the gift by Derrida. The gift is also one of the motifs Derrida insists on in his text in memory of Goffman. In fact, he even proposes as one, of, as one possible title for his text, Les dons de Sarah Goffman. As Penelope Deutscher has brilliantly shown, the logic of the gift is paramount to understand uh, Goffman and Derrida's friendship. Let's remind us what Derrida understands by gift. Uh, it's in given time. For there to be a gift, for there to be a gift, it must go unrecognized and radically forgotten. Because if the donor and the donee recognize the gift as separate from themselves, then either a debt will be incurred and the gift is no longer a gift as such, or the gift will be annulled by some form of return. Looking at the dissymmetry between Kaufman's and Derrida's acknowledgments of the work of the other, in the perspective of the impossible structure of the gift, one is led to reinterpret Sarah Kaufman's relative, uh, sorry, Sarah Kaufman's relative, relative absence from Derrida's text as the only, however, operatic way to make the impossible gift 
and forgiving possible. What's interesting to me is that this logic of the impossible gift is also what seems to come on what I've called Derrida's erasure of women. In Women in the Beehive, Derrida is asked to expand on the relationship between the impossible gift and sexual difference, particularly in relation to a passage of choreographies where he touches upon the gift and sexual ontology. Here is what he responds. Let's begin with the idea of destination. In general, when one speaks of woman, of, sorry, when one speaks of man or of woman, one supposes, for example, that a man speaks to a woman, that a woman speaks to a man, that they are identifiable subjects, and that between them there exists an exchange. The messages, the gifts, caresses, desires, objects, etc., have a giver and a receiver, a destination between two subjects. Inasmuch as a gift has an assignable destination, it is an exchange, therefore it is not a gift. There is a difference between a gift and an exchange. If there is, from the man to the woman, or from the woman to the man, a destination of whatever kind, of an object, of a resource, of a letter, of desire, of resource, if this thing is identifiable, identifiable as passing from subject to subject, from a man to a woman, or from a woman to a woman, or a man to a man, if there is a possible determination of subjects, at that moment, there is no longer a gift. Consequently, there is no gift except in that all determinations, particularly sexual determinations as classically defined, are absolutely unconscious and random. And this randomness is a chance of the gift. The gift must be given by chance. Derrida goes on, dreaming that there would be one sex for each time. Actually. In other words, if there is no woman, it is because sexual positions, understood here as both gender and sexual and sexualities, are reshuffled with each giving interaction. Sarah Kaufman actually expressed an opinion not very far from Derrida's on the matter of what she calls sexual positions, though adopting the exact opposite position. Making the argument for an originary bisexuality, she claimed that il n'y a ni homme ni femme and that tout être humain est capable de toutes les potentialités de l'autre sexe. Regarding her own writing, contrary to Derrida, who claimed to voice a polysexual discourse, like in Fulassan, for example, that intertwines feminine and masculine voices, or who even claimed to be a woman, like in La Carte Postale, uh, Kaufman claims not to be writing like a woman, even to write like a man, but still with something else. I leave you with Kaufman's words and with this odd duo of uh, man philosopher, male philosopher who pretends to write like a woman while erasing women, and of a woman philosopher who claims to be writing like a man while obsessively writing on women. Il ne faut pas confondre les distinctions sociales et anatomiques avec les distinctions psychiques, c'est-à-dire les positions. On peut être anatomiquement un homme et avoir une position féminine. Inversement, une femme peut avoir une position masculine. Mais il faudrait dire « dites masculine » puisque ces catégories devraient disparaître. Je cherche à me définir à travers tout mon travail comme quelqu'un qui a une volonté de vérité par rapport à toute une mystification, dans l'université, dans la philosophie. Je dois donc représenter cette position même si je suis anatomiquement et socialement une femme. Je n'ai aucune des caractéristiques que la métaphysique décrit comme féminine, telles que l'inconstance par exemple. Par ailleurs, je subvertis cette catégorie stricte qui serait « j'écris comme un homme » en introduisant aussi, à l'intérieur de cette écriture du jeu, du plaisir, de la jubilation. Mais les hommes peuvent faire cela aussi. Mmh. Cela, c'est le propre de l'écriture. Okay. Et notre second speaker de cette soirée est Peter de Graber, qui est professeur de philosophie et de l'esthétique à l'Université de Lovain. De Grave's research interests primarily focus on contemporary art, French philosophy, hermeneutics, and aesthetics. And he is the author of several books. And this is where I'm going to see how brave I can be in attempting at my Dutch pronunciation. A book on Friedrich Nietzsche, which is Paus on End Her Wording from 2003, and Gilles Deleuze on Het Materialism in 2011. He's also the co editor of Jean Luc Nancy, the Prince van Het Denken, 2007. With my apologies for that appalling pronunciation. But please join me in welcoming Peter de Graaf. Um, I've changed the title and we're supposed to understand why in a few minutes. Uh, 
Um, I, I'd like to join everyone in uh, thanking uh, uh, John and Jacob uh, for organizing this event. Uh, and I am, I was, I am happy to be in the company of uh, such eminent readers and writers and thinkers. So thank you for that. And I had also a personal reason to come here. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I was um, uh, Sarah Kaufman was my first PhD supervisor back in those days before I went on an acrobatic journey through Europe, um, um, which ultimately ended up in uh, Strasbourg, mm -hmm. thanks to her, because uh, she showed me the way to uh, work with Philippe Latour-Labart. So I came here to pay tribute, or uh, connect about it. So, this works like that. Autobiography. Seems to be a guideline in many recent interpretations of Sarah Kaufman's work, and so, allegedly, a fundamental feature of her philosophy. I will try to argue somehow ex negativo that it is not. It uh, is something else. I gave the alternative a name, a la biography. <laughs> the other of biography and autobiography, or even of classical hermeneutics, if you like. I'll introduce you to this stranger later. For now, I can only say that allobiography is a concept designed to get to the far side of ontological methodology, although I don't have the faintest idea in what crater I might land or crash there. Allobiography is designed to sense or capture what I would uh, call the having force of Kaufman in philosophy. My aim is to reinforce those features. Allobiography and having force are intrinsically related. We know from her testimony that she didn't feel close to Heidegger. Quote, his text doesn't transform me. I like to think that this aversion has something to do with Heidegger's relentless methodological research of ontological fundamentals, and that this area its purity, uh, its seriousness, its monotony was strange to Kaufman. What was her area? That's the beyond I'm referring to, or far sight, an alibi. Maybe my aim or Kaufman's philosophical practice is not to go literally beyond ontology or beyond being, but rather beyond the compelling claim of Heidegger's hermeneutical principle that being is the transcendence pure and simple, Shatin, the principle to which I believe he remained loyal all of his life. Autobiography then would be the name for a suspicion towards this hermeneutical ecstasy. It's the name of an ideal subtlety in reading and writing philosophy, which was, I believe, Kaufman's essential practice, her force. Somewhere, uh, Mathieu Frakoviak notes in relation to Kaufman's explosions that in her texts something always doesn't make sense. On the other hand, clarity, être net, was a rigorous ideal of, in Kaufman's philosoph philosophy practice. I will argue that there is no contradiction here, but that both go together, not so much harmoniously as indeed subtly subtly forcefully. Clarity in Kaufman's texts is an effect of force, of forces, at work in her thinking. The forces are played out or allowed to play and therefore sense always hangs in the balance. In the words of Jean-Luc Nancy, Kaufman never exposed her thinking to a compelling type of methodology. There is a plurality of poroi always close to aporia, as you know, there is no singularity of methodos. And above all, there is a faithfulness to that idea of aporia. In that sense, the will to truth uh, to Kaufman, in Kaufman, is also uh, always also will to digression, aberration, pervertibility, uh, contamination, and so forth. That's the reason I think that her philosophy isn't built on any master concepts, ruling over the practice of reading and writing, forging the different elements into a systematic unity. No ereignis, no transgression, no difference avec A, although that was not meant to be a concept. 
no planes of consistency or of immanence, no grandiloquent concepts of love, art, politics or truth to reorient the whole of humanity. Neither are there any books on the principles of hermeneutics, such as Gadamer's Truth and Method, or Vatimo's Beyond Interpretation. She did not seem to bother to advance principles of that sort in, say, programmatic texts, as you could eventually qualify a number of books and essays by Derrida, Nancy, and many others. I like to think that Sarah Kaufman preferred to step right into the middle of texts and of the multiple forces they generate. If anything, that's a Nietzschean practice to me. In what follows, I will focus on some aspects of Sarah Kaufman's practice as a philosopher, taken from a larger context, of course, and on certain reactions to them. I'll contextualize them and then proceed as swiftly and clearly as I can to the explanation of the concepts I've just presented. In a long and affectionate letter to Derrida on October 1st, 1979, Kaufman wrote, I quote, book, one can displace and overthrow everything. One can say each other everything, not anything, n'importe quoi, but everything, too. Kaufman is writing to Derrida because she wants to tell him the story of her reading excerpts of the section's envoys of his book, The Postcard. Section where Derrida, as you know, comes back once again to the philosophical topping, topic of writing in Plato. I quote, In the middle of the night, Kaufman writes, I wake up and invent meanings that you might not have imagined. Que tu n'aurais pas imaginé. End of quote. I think it's marvelous somehow. Derrida, having already published La Pharmacie de Platon more than 10 years before, is now coming back to the same theme in the postcard, which takes in numerous pages, and here is Sarah Kaufman, assuring him that not yet everything has been imagined. So, as for Plato, for Kaufman as well, the dream isn't just a dream, a sequence of involuntary images, it's the force of dreaming. As far as dreaming is concerned, she is fully awake, and I could add already at this point, like maybe no one around her. Kaufman's alleged will to truth, see clearly, être net, is in my opinion another name for something much deeper, what I uh, call this having force, having force in seeing, having force off seeing, which seems to be related somehow to the larger energy of dreaming. In Ron Sarah, his commemorating essay of 1997, Jean-Luc Nancy, more or less like this conference, asserts that Kaufman <coughs> means truth. In philosophy, the, unquote, the openness, it's Nancy, the openness of sense is truth. That's the ecstatic version of truth, or at least a powerful echo of it. The ontological recuperation, if you like, of the classical hermeneutical explanation of truth as discovery, as Schlossenheit and Dichtheit, introduced by Heidegger, further developed by Gadamer and his pupils. Openness, fair enough. Philosophy, Nancy emphasizes, maintains, and by maintaining, supports this openness of meaning, entretien ouverture de sens. It doesn't allow it to deposit itself, se déposer, or to go quiet or silent. It doesn't allow sense, for meaning, to be foreclosed in itself. Il ne le laisse pas se, re se refermer. In Kaufman's work, Nancy continues, the opening of sense, of meaning, being truth, is not at all a finality or teleology, finalité. In her multiple interpretations, and Nancy justly and beautifully describes them as, quote, ravishing, delightful, jubilant infinity, end of quote. There is no desire whatsoever for accomplishment, for the achieving of an ultimate goal. No, there's a much deeper recule and much more severe, rigorous, severe, 
truth at work here that goes by the name of necessity. That's possible. Once more, fair enough. I can follow. All this makes perfectly sense within the horizon of Nancy's thinking. Yet to me, necessity is not the deepest layer of Kaufman's interpretation labor. <clears throat> it is force. And necessity without force is just an empty ontological box. The necessities one is up against only become vivid, if you like, through the forces you deploy or employ in life. And samples, laws, samples, etc. And one sees one here, I would refer to Sartre, no less. Being in itself is nothing. You have to be, ou n'a à être. As a young woman, Kaufman read these words, as you all know, hidden under her bed using a flashlight. There is no necessity without a deeper force, encore plus reculé. At the end of the same paragraph, on deep and severe truth, Nancy cites the first page of Kaufman's Pure Donnet, and I quote Nancy, quoting Kaufman, you all know the quote. Maybe my numerous books have been obligatory sideways or crossroads, voie de traverse, for arriving at the story of that. Nancy centers this quote around the concepts of necessity and obligation. Then, finally, he asks, Sa Quoi? That? What? And qui sera? Sera who? Those are key questions indeed. And I am today, I must say, not completely satisfied with the many answers in numerous texts following Nazis I have read on the matter. It's important. Our practice of philosophy could depend on the answers we provide to the questions of what that was and who Sarah is. In the many portraits of her, dressed by friends and colleagues shortly after her death, and by plenty of scholars in the following years, we do get a pretty good idea of who Sarah was as a person. But who was she as a philosopher? Tracy? I'm not mean to, mean to make the distinction, but to get them together. Who was she as a philosopher? That's a whole other story. Thanks to the portraits, we see the laughing, the tenacity, the worrying, the pain, the waywardness, the truthfulness, the acts of resistance, of protest, the passionate teaching. It's all there. In the variety, the necessary, necessary variety, one can say with Nancy, of a discovered life. We hear and see the signals of her infancy and childhood coming, among others, from uh, Jean Morel. Uh, Jean Morel with uh, his Enfance de Sarah, au pluriel, from uh, Caroline Feiertag, and dedicating about one third of her bi biography to Sarah's juvenile years, or of course from uh, Kaufman herself, uh, not only in Rue Ordonnaire, but also, for instance, in the letter to Derrida I've just quoted. Hmm. where she writes to her distinguished friend, quote, I have loved it that, do, that you love yourself as a child. Tu t'aimes enfant. I think the friend is stronger there. You uh, love yourself as a child, and because you are such, I have always believed I could say you everything without offense, even when it's sometimes difficult talking to you. Si difficile de te parler. Me too. I am a child and love to laugh and love being loved. End of quote. A beautiful text by François Armango introduces us to Kaufman's existential polarity, a life always between a moderate and a, an immoderate taste for laughing and, quote, the presentment of nearby wretchedness, distress, and détresse. And still, Armango, an excess of physical sufferings, Armango continues, consisting of, quote, permanent pain as a consequence of a car accident, recurring fears of a cancer in spite of its successful re removal by operation years earlier, excessive moral suffering, end of quote. Touching, Nancy would say. Yet, there are other texts. Evoking Kaufman's distress, 
in life and work. Hermeneutical accounts of some sort built around the narrative of Rue Ordonner. The analysis philosophizes about the relation between, on, on the one hand, the autobiographical story, the childhood years of hiding during World War II, of losing her father to Auschwitz, of losing her identity as a Jewish girl, and on the other, the corpus, the work of the adult intellectual. Reminding you of Nancy's warning, some of these interpretations do insert finality into Kaufmann's thinking, the autobiography. But both uh, the alleged goal, it's all about the story, that story, from here it all becomes clear, that is it, and so. And the connecting dots in between, uh, the means to get there by interpretation, are bluntly mistaken. The interpretations are faint, powerless, and therefore wrong. The portraits they come up with that simply aren't true, but net. Therefore, I will now turn inevitably to autobiography, although it's not my subject. In fact, I believe in philosophy, autobiography is an impossible subject. We must say it as clearly as we can, there isn't any autobiography in philosophy. If it's an autobiography, it's no longer philosophy. If it's philosophy, it's, it can never be merely autobiographical. That being said, some of the accounts on the autobiographical in Kaufmann, I do sympathize with. Uh, approaches by uh, Tina Charter, uh, Michael Maas, uh, Fleischer de Armit, for instance, among many others. And, uh, who, according to me, at the same time playfully and earnestly try to displace the idea of autobiography and Kaufmann's work in life. Other texts, though, too many for us to analyze in depth in detail on this occasion, are symptomatic for a fundamental misreading of Kaufmann's philosophy, which is, in my view, in itself symptomatic for the misreading of philosophy schlechthin. The list is long, I won't go name dropping, just a few examples. The procedures of misreading are more or less the same. After having introduced an interpretative narrative on Kaufmann's philosophy in general, one moves to Rue Rue to reduce, finally, Kaufmann's life to autobiography, with or without uh, Guillemin. And, uh, autobiography, and to its multiple problems, its fantasies, paradoxes, failures, its swindle. Mm -hmm. You name it, it's there in one degree or other. The crux in all of this is trauma. Personal, existential trauma. And how it relates to life and thought. I don't mean to say that trauma isn't there. If I'm right, psychologically speaking, it's always there. But the question, and the philosophical question, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the real question here, probably not, seems to be how trauma relates to the problem of meaning, and in our case, how the life work of a philosopher such as Sarah Kaufman contributes to it, to it. I'll try to briefly make my point on trauma, what that was, then move on to the item of autobiography, who Sarah is, before concluding with some remarks concerning my initial statements on autobiography and force. And force Kaufman, the Kaufman dream. There's no reason for us to, say, repress the subject of trauma. Uh, we cannot deny human entanglement in and dependence upon traumatizing history, in a way History is trauma. See Norman Brown after Freud, see Deleuze after Spinoza. In an early review of uh, Lyotard's Heidegger and the Jews, reference was made to the first, the first original traumatism. The premier traumatisme originel. Interesting concept. Constituted by what Lyotard called himself the Urverdrängung of the Jewish element in European history. In his book, Harry and the Jews, Lyotard relates to Philippe Lacoulabart's concept of cesura, to explain not only 
a historical event of the elimination and destruction of European Jews by the Nazis, but also um, are unease with that history. So, from the Nazis' efforts to erase their crimes, huh, obliterate history, to our impulse to forget about it. Huh? All of this comes down to mechanisms of trauma. If it has Vienna and Freiburg lectures on the book a year later, actually begin with the notion of trauma, and the trauma of the war and of Auschwitz for both Austrians and Germans, and the trauma of Heidegger for German and French students just after the war, one of which was Lyotard, who calls himself a young Parisian. The link between these traumas and the so-called primary repression, Urverdrängung, is made in both lectures. Not only is the trauma said to be real, it's also original, primary, fundamental, in that it incessantly triggers the desire to cut them, the Jews, off. Therefore, this is the forgotten l'oubli, capital F, capital O, that, quote, quote Lyotard, never ceases to return to claim its due. From these passages by Lyotard, we gather that the importance of trauma is undeniable. Constitutive for European history in general, and for the philosophy of that history uh, in particular. It's trauma on a global scale, and both in space and time. Looking at it from that angle, all of a sudden, trauma becomes something huge, caused by the whole of European history, and at the same time, the cause of history. A double bind, if ever there was one. While reading those lines, I couldn't help but remember that other conference uh, some ten years before, in July 1980, in Cerzi La Salle de Fin de l'Homme dedicated to Derrida, the picture we saw in the film was uh, taken at the conference. There, Lyotard had already asked the question of how to speak, form sentences or thoughts, phrase, after Auschwitz. The lecture, 1980, on Adorno, not Heidegger, also elaborated the theme of raptures, cesura, and of Auschwitz as the name for that anonymous event marking the radical splitting of Europe's history. The name Auschwitz being an unname, a sans nom. That's the right traduction, the translation. On that occasion, in the discussion following Leotard's lecture, Sarah Kaufman mentioned for the first time what would later become the alleged story of her life, her father's death in a Nazi camp. In the all too scarce discussion notes of the session, Kaufman argued that the tattooed regimental numbers at Auschwitz were already death by anonymity, mort par anonyma, preceding death pure and simple, mort de coup. Dans le texte, on pourrait dire de façon allégrienne, tout de Forget that, I'm on that code. That's fine. Now, here's my provocative question. Can you also die of name and not only of anonymity? Can you die of having a name instead of losing one? Almost all the theories in her so called autobiography actually function as a forgetting by naming, capital letters like Lyotard. They do not explain, they do obscure. It's an alienating appropriation. For instance, analysis by Robson and Faulkner painfully reduce Kaufman's life both as a person and as a philosopher to trauma, in Robson's case, and to the self-deceiving nar narrative on trauma and falconers. Kaufman herself, Robson claims, wants to control narrative, but it is her body, now constipated, then vomiting, that speaks out. Kifal, huh? one would say with Lyotard. Beyond any verbal control. The body, not the philosopher's mind, tells us about or truthfully indicates the trauma. Uh, Kaufman's short text, Magiela Psychanalyse, uh, in, which, quote, in which the body is posited as marker of her ability or inability to speak in analysis, 
according to Robson. So makes all this explicit. That's right. Namely, that it is a body that effectively represents, not figures, the limits and possibilities of the narrative. Now, is that so? Didn't Kaufman say in the same text, Marie, that what she discloses there, I quote, shouldn't be affected with meaning, shouldn't be interpreted? Robson denies this. Moreover, the possibility that for Kaufman the experience of trauma could lie beyond psychoanalysis or psychotherapy is not taken into consideration. And Robson's bodily detours are in fact themselves limits forced upon Kaufman's thinking. In the account of Mavi, I believe, rather has to do with the intimate affinity Kaufman's philosophy has with the kind of limitless traumatism Lyotard talked about, and which is the trauma of history itself and the trauma of thinking bound together. The trauma of the thinking of history and the trauma of the history of thinking. Robson somehow misses the real trauma. As does Faulkner, in my opinion, when she's out to prove that Kaufman's lifelong interpretations of Nietzsche, and especially of Nietzsche's autobiography, explosions, are entirely dependent on her own traumatic relation to her mother and father. Exactly as Nietzsche was himself and shows himself in Ecce Homo. According uh, to Faulkner, Nietzsche enables Kaufman to recover a part of her identity, her Jewishness, that she herself had repudiated initially. She recovers this through Nietzsche. Nevertheless, the final result for Kaufman was, I quote Faulkner, Incomplete and transitory identification, porosity of boundaries, um, wary admiration, collusion of fantasies. Her interest in Nietzsche was traumatic fascination. Then a final example. Discuss parricidal autobiographies, text of the uh, as careful a comment as it is on the relation between Kaufman's Nietzsche interpretation and her own autobiographical writings, Riordanet, encore, claims, so Liska claims, that during World War II, the French woman adopting Sarah and giving her a hiding name, Suzanne, divested, I quote, so stripped the little girl of, I quote, Liska, of her difference in order to turn her into one like herself. The French woman, another quote from this guy, obliterated her, Kaufman's Jewish otherness, to make her the same as herself. Yet, Kaufman always observed more care than the most careful of her commentators. In a copy of the French original of the Childhood of Art, Kaufman wrote the following dedication to Claire Schemitre, the famous Lady of the Rue Laban. And I quote, you know the quote, for my Mime, who saved my life and therefore is the first to have allowed me to write this book, Kisses Sarah, end of quote. Or, in an interview in Le Monde, many years later, 1986, her readers are told how Kaufmann's mother, Felix Akkerny, her birth mother, quote, on several occasions removed her with force from class to bring her home. Or, quote, switch off electricity in the house at night to prevent her from breathing. Was that her mother's behavior? Not also an infringement of yet another kind of otherness? One wonders. There's, I want to say, there's a subtlety, a nuance, Nietzsche would say, and a gratitude in Kaufman's own approach that is almost completely lacking in that of her, of her or some of her analysts. I can agree, to some extent, with Liska's point. But it too is unsound. Kaufman was not divested of her difference, as if she wore it as a cloak. I think that her difference was intensified, tragically, by the events related, which forced her to become more diverse. Her Jewish otherness, as if otherness can be a thing to appropriate, was not necessarily obliterated from 
that very moment on, or from that episode on, it was also dramatically enriched, becoming in the girl, in the young woman, more conscious and clearer than before. It is definitely not so, as Lagovici suggests, that Kaufman, quote, only writes to forget her own family novel in a way. All this I call death by naming, reduced to that one trauma, only one person, one name remains. Kaufman is in danger of dying of that name. She's dying of having been granted a name, which isn't hers, because it is hers. Reduced to be her father's child. One name, proper, she cannot get rid of because it is made to surround and enclose her like a nurse's robe, instead of the many names she actually chose to live in and lives on in. Final meditation before my conclusion. In the same letter to Derrida, we call it twice, she writes, I was touched by a lot of things in your texts, even if I'm not your destined one, or your destiny, ta destiné, is exquisitely ambiguous. Never even directly spoken to, never named, jamais nommé, as so many others are. She did recognize death by anonymity when she saw it. But how to name her then improperly? And my concluding remarks, and to make them I make just a little detour. Nietzsche, as you know, ended up identifying with every name in history in the letter to Bukhart. In another letter, the famous letter to Cosmo Wagner, he says to have been Buddha among the Indians, Dionysus among the ancient Greeks, that Alexander and Caesar are his incarnations, that he was Voltaire and Napoleon, and probably Wagner too. I like to think that Kaufman too not only saw the fun of it, despite the personal tragedy, but also the deeper truth. Because, really, what's the difference with a fragment Nietzsche wrote in the autumn of 1881 when he's busy inventing his alter ego for his son, Zarathustra? Quote, when I, Nietzsche, when I'm talking of Plato, Pascal, Spinoza, and Goethe, I know that their blood runs through my veins. Or a few months earlier, in a sketch of a plan for Zarathustra, I quote, the relentless transformation, in a short period of time, you must pass through many individuals. The means, the middle, the way, is the relentless struggle, end of quote. Often herself, as you know, passing through Freud and Nietzsche, maybe and others, passing through Freud and Nietzsche, claimed to be in possession of the same sort of transformative force. I quote her in an interview, as I turn to Freud and Nietzsche, I transform them, and they transform me. To read a philosopher, she asserts in her book on Socrates, means to conquer, and somehow to make yours, sans parer de, the kind of forces that linger there. It's not so much about being a philosopher then, as it is about returning incessantly, eternally, to the immemorial forces slumbering there, under the cover of things, of books, of names. It's about going into those forces, <coughs> into that past, while trying to figure out if some of that immemorial blood also runs through your veins. Figure out if you have it. It is the abundance of places you return to continuously, where you actually have been, where you have seen, and have been seen, 
although you realize quite lucidly that they, those places, do not exist. They're your allies. It's that struggle, as Nietzsche called it, and the insane undertaking of transforming them while being transformed by them in return. Now, this autobiographical force is at the heart of Sarah Kaufman's thinking, taking place, say taking place. We're always elsewhere because it is. Say everything, be everywhere. The true philosopher, while allegedly writing autobiographically, always dresses the portrait of the world, not just of him or herself. That's what Eke Hong is all about. It's a portrait of the world. It's not a portrait of Nietzsche. It's a self-portrait of Nietzsche as a world, or the self-portrait as a world. Only by being and seeing and being seen elsewhere can you truly be here. It's our only alibi. And Kaufman had the force, like no one before her, to be elsewhere here, uh, not only in order to remember or commemorate that first original trauma, but to make us realize that giving it a name will not suffice. You have to give it many names. And you have to try to live those names as yours. As long as we do not embrace the struggle of transforming the past while being transformed by it, as long as we do not launch our thinking into that adventure, this crater, or um, as long as we do not, let's play of words, uh, begin without hope of getting out, since how it would read semantically, commence sans sortir, a poetically returning to ourselves through the multiplicity of names and forcing ourselves to feel their blood running through our bodies, as long as we do not do that, we will always somehow end up forgetting more, forgetting deeper. I conclude. So, yes, with her history, for Kaufman too, it was quite insane to say, I am the child of Nietzsche. But it was truly her privilege as a philosopher. Who else had the courage and the force to say a crazy thing like that. It is the kind of privileges we urgently need to reinforce and be reinforced by. She, I think, showed us the way. Therefore, yes, you. I can only conclude by saying to you today, I am the child of Kaufman. <laughs> his PhD dissertation at Paris-Louis, and his dissertation is on the relation between the problem of animality and the motif of writing in Derrida's thought. And he has two recently published papers, one entitled Affirming a Weak Force, the Pious Vow of an Animal to Come, in the Oxford Literary Review, and the second one for the academic website Fabula, La Déconstruction à l'Occulte de l'Azur Semiotique, so please join me in welcoming Justine. Thank you, Mel. And uh, thank you, Jacob and John, for the organization as I said. Hey, I'm my remerciement. And uh, so it's quite a responsibility to conclude after this conclusion, which was very conclusive. <laughs> but, and I'm no specialist of Hoffman either, so I'm beginning with a with a simple question, which uh, goes like this: Are metaphor and fetish synonyms? The simple, this simple question turns out to be abysmal because synonymy is a compromise formation and demands a semantic shifting through two distinct signifiers to indicate the common meaning. But what if every meaning a concept were but a metaphor or a fetish? If a concept is a fetish, metaphor and fetish become antonyms. 
yet no concept, no concept exists as such. Metaphor, in fact, is turned out to indicate one and the same configuration, that of generalized substitution. So metaphor and fetish would be essentially identical, yet both metaphor and fetish designate substitutes as opposed to originals. Their generalization effaces originality and compels to deal with paleonymy, which is the use of a metaphysical signifier to hint at a non-metaphysical conception, as if dissimulating it. Then speaking of metaphor and fetish alike, we should use brackets, but how to tell brackets? How to master the sophism of homonymy? How to dissim dissimulate well? Maybe we must impose new names, for example, interpretation in the place of metaphor, colossus for fetish. Yet again, what of these replacements? This, a certain oscillation remains and leaves us unsatisfied. This question seems rhetoric, sterile, fetishist, as it were. For Freud, uh, a philosophical speculation on hollow names can, can be a sublimation of clothing fetishism, of feminine fetishism, repressing a passive scopic drive, because a woman from Freud would like to want to be seen, and this is why she adorns herself with garments. Doesn't Sarah Kaufman's mimetic writing recall this position, as Jeanette Michaud remarks? I see so to signal a peculiar difficulty. In what follows, I will try to push as far as possible the criticism of Kaufman's articulation of metaphor and fetish, but in reading Kaufman, one never knows who is reading whom. I think that most of this articulation of metaphor and fetish is at, at work, so, as it were, already in Nietzsche and metaphor, except maybe for one last twist. For Kaufman, Nietzsche provides, I quote, a theory between brackets of the generalization of metaphor based on the loss of any problem, between brackets, end quote. There's the unity of reality as life, which is not that of substance, substance, but of becoming. There is nothing stable, nothing proper, be it individual or universal, noetic or semiotic. Accordingly, even this elementary fact or truth is not seizable, impossible to be properly thought or expressed, above all conceptual. So this can only be expressed metaphorically, but since there is nothing that ties together metaphors, expression here becomes invention. Finally, this condition, our condition, does not even exist, properly speaking. So this is indeed quite scary. That's why the metaphor chosen by the early Nietzsche, that's also why, let's just to say, chosen by the early Nietzsche to hint at, at this are Dionysus and Apollo, the Apollonian metaphorical surface relieving from the Dionysian abyss and the metaphorical play of the two figures giving relief from this difficult reality giving relief that is enhancing a certain kind of life. This conception entails a new notion of metaphor. As we, as, as Peter told us, Paul, oh, sorry. For Aristotle, metaphor is the imposition of the, of the name of something onto something else according to analogy or to the logic uh, of genera and species. This version of metaphor is ancillary to concept. For Nietzsche, instead, concept is a case of metaphor, and especially for the Romantic Nietzsche, a late derivation from the Dionysian source of all transpositions. Worse than this, Kaufman stresses the corruption, if not the perversion, of concept vis-à-vis -vis more originary artistic metaphors. A concept is a deceptive and self-deceptive compromise relieving from the scary realm of generalized metaphor, thus enhancing another kind of life, one that seeks relief from itself. And besides, if all there is is life as a generalized metaphor, what else but life would like to seek relief from? So this is why Kaufman puts theory and proper between brackets in the first quotation I quote. As Nietzsche does with truth, there is no stable eidos. Every genos is a decolored metaphor. Theory is another metaphor. One can only act or practice somehow and properly as if between brackets. This version of uh, metaphor provided by first Nietzsche seems eminently deconstructive, and yet not enough for Kaufman. Metaphor, the word and the notion, still entails a bond to the rhetoric, which is to metaphysics. Metaphor would be the transposition of a kernel of meaning into a means of expression, of an origin into a career. Accordingly, there would be better and worse careers, such as music versus logic, good and bad rhetoric, and essentially so. 
This, according to Kofon, will lead Nietzsche to abandon metaphor as a strategic level. The, the generalization of metaphor at the expense of concept is only first the constructive phase preliminary to the affirmation of generalized texts of the artistic force of interpretation. This is a quote, quotation, sorry, of Wittbauer. Kaufman is magisterial in stressing this articulation of metaphor and with power, and yet, how can the direct, uh, op sorry, how can text and interpretation, as she writes, have the advantage over metaphor of no longer being the direct opposites of the proper? Do they have this advantage? And is metaphor opposed to the proper? In fact, as Kaufman says, it is a concept and orbits around concept. And more. In later Nietzsche, metaphor would be, I quote, thought of as a metaphorical notion, symbolic of the artistic force, named, named between brackets, will to power. But is not will to power a metaphor, a palimony, bearing the strongest relation to the proper, will? Moreover, if the concept metaphor is a metaphor of will to power, then rhetoric is a metaphor of its artistic force. So, is rhetoric a worse rhetorical means than art? Is rhetoric bad rhetoric? Kaufman says so, in a way. Metaphor must be abandoned as a bad metaphor. Artistic activity, instead, is a good model, she writes. A legitimate paradigm, according to Nietzsche, of course. Maybe, maybe of Kaufman, I don't know. Of what? A legitimate paradigm of unconscious activity. Of the bodily, instinctual processes that, um, that can only be alluded to metaphorically, which is of life. And yet, because no proper exists, should, shouldn't one say, paradoxically, a good, a good or, or bad model in absolute terms? Kaufman writes that for Nietzsche, body and soul are two mutually metaphorical systems, but also that a conscious activity, be it rhetoric or art, I quote, is but a detour and simplification of unconscious activity. Quote again, without which it cannot be understood. Thus, metaphor, more conscious than art, is a worse model than art, which is, I quote, a prolongation of the work of unconscious activity. But its metaphor is also a worse model because it is less conscious or less honest. I quote, art is a legitimate paradigm of unconscious activity because it is but a particular case, the one that can give itself for what it is, end quote. So, some measure of good and bad operates here, be it contiguity, similarity, or maybe a sort of self-awareness. And yet, doesn't Kaufman describe the artistic and the metaphorical constitution of the world as one and the same thing, as a process of transfer and selection that can produce idealization, as life? Maybe one should write life between brackets, since it seems like the reference to life, which is the very proper of metaphysics, like a powerful magnet, reinstates a series of dualisms, body and soul, flesh, flesh and ghost, in Kaufman's text, Kaufman's account of Nietzsche's description of, uh, of his theory of general, generalized metaphor. So, dualisms like body and soul, flesh and ghost, strong and weak, the originary text of the unconscious and the figural language of conscience, this is Kaufman, good and bad, good and evil. And the signifier that bears this contradiction is metaphor, traditionally. So maybe the fetish will help us orientate in this landscape. The proper to which metaphor refers is in fact invented by conceptual sublimation. The concept is a product, metaphorical activity, of selective, of selective transfer of will to power. A case of metaphor, like art, but peculiar. The one, the one that crafts the notion of stable truth, which is the farthest metaphor from the text of instincts, Establish, establishing so an essential generality which occults the generalization of metaphor. That is, establishing a bad, false, and evil deceptive generalization. The concept is a perverse substitute, a fetish. The difference between art and rhetoric, then, is a difference between metonymies of metaphor. The fetish conceptual metaphor diverts metaphor away from, from its own metaphoric or artistic tenor. And the fetish's plainest manifestation is its best concealing. So hypnosis, dissimulation at its best, is the, the faculty of the fetish. Mm, but isn't dissimulation, according to Nietzsche, nature's essence, between brackets and hormones? 
How to tell a fetish, then, from a natural product or from a work of art? How to put it back into its context? How to distinguish a fetish in absolute terms? These questions can be stated, maybe metaphorically, like this. How to tell a robot from Medusa or from Circe? Circe. To answer, to try to answer, we shall consider the twofold constitution of Kaufmann's fetish, Nietzschean and Freud. For Nietzsche, ein grosses fetish wesen, ein grosses fetishism, is responsible for the constitution of the language and word of metaphysics. By conjuring up first a substantial subject, one that has one will, second, a word of causal agents attributing will to things, becoming idols, and third, attributing causality and unity to words and their meanings. So, will. The word and the concept is the main fetish of this animism. Yet, Kaufmann remarks, instead of Comte's fetishism, Nietzsche's is not a closed phase, a past past. It's an imminent structure of sublimation propelled by active forgetfulness. A past right here and now and already ahead in the future. Fetis fetishization, this redissement et durcissement of metaphors, this is a translation by Kaufmann of of the passage by the expression by Nietzsche. So, fetishization aims at forgetting Genesis by erecting a phantomatic phallus as the supposed origin of any becoming. As formalized in Camera Obscura, genetic reversal plus sublimating counter investment. This definition must stress in Freudian contribution, and I quote uh, Kaufman The concept plays the role of the force of counter investment, which maintains the repression. It entails, beside the original forgetting, which is characteristic, as Kaufman says, of every metaphorical activity, a secondary repression. Repressing, that is, giving relief from the realm of metaphor and becoming, the concept establishes the ghostly king of, king of, of identity. But stable identity is a mask, first of all for the metaphorical and oscillating constitution of the fetish. So a concept, above all, is an auto-referred, auto -referred, This assemblage by Kaufman is powerful, but something might be uneven. Maybe Kaufman's fetish exposes and represses a contradiction between two layers or a dualism between two layers of forgetfulness, primary and secondary. I quote Kaufman, the metaphorical activity, always already forgotten, is repressed secondarily by means of a deliberate abandonment in favor of concept, science, logic, and hope. So the artistic or metaphorical activity of instincts always already entails forgetfulness. This is a structural necessity. And yet, the secondary oubli comes to repress this primary one. The secondary layer is the one that carves the abyss, the goof, as Kaufman has it, between metaphor and concept. Its agent is metaphysics and religion, and its action is deliberate, as the quote says. So, concepts or fetishes are not only bad, violent, and evil metaphor, but also deliberately so. This is perversion, and for Nietzsche, this is the perversion of the true priesthood. It's radical evil. But how can a fetish construction be deliberate? And most of all, how can metaphor in general, as art or as nature, be innocent? In other terms, can oubli not necessarily be oubli de l'oubli? Can dissimulation not be dissimulation of dissimulation? Is not nature a lady that has good reasons not to show or to not show her reasons, like Bobo <laughs> and Circe alike? For Nietzsche, from inorganic According to Nietzsche, from inorganic matter up, the transport of will to power necessarily entails repression and unification. So metaphor is always already secondary and forgetfulness active. If the goof is carved by secondary processes at the expense of primary ones, these had already been secondary and so on. So the goof is neither secondary nor cultural, but ineludible. Fetish fetishization is a consequence of this necessity. That concept, if concept is still a metaphor, we agree, a metaphor is already a concept or a fetish. And moreover, only if, only if a metaphor is a fetish, an unfaithful substitution in the realm of will to power, which is an interpretation, the articulation of rhetoric and will to power is possible. Even more so when one interpretation, such as Nietzsche's text of the eternal return and will to power, gives, gives itself as an interpretation. Such affirmation is tragic, 
because it's a, it affirms its contradictory status, scary and joyful, all encompassing and fetish like partial, truer than truth and miserably fake. And this, since this affirmation is not one of a kind, it's not unique, since, e since each perspective, absolutely, sorry, absolutely singular, is as such absolutely generic, it cannot but give way to the return of the repressed as well as, as to some event. And this is maybe why eternal return and will to power can coincide. Mm, so, no goof is filled, it can only be relaunched. There's no coming back from the concept of metaphor, nor from the crucified Dionysus. This, this politics shall be endured, according to Nietzsche, propelled, trying to be faster and subtler at once older and younger than any interpretation, dreaming to endure the return of everything, including the repressed, even this spider, writes Nietzsche, speaking of eternal return. On the contrary, to me, it seems that the return of the origin might be what, what Kaufman might be denying. The negation, which is structurally auto-referred, the negation, the negation, of course. For, for Kaufman, the goof carved by metaphysics is filled by the generalization, generalization of metaphor, or at least she says that Nietzsche feels or tries to fill this goof with the generalization of metaphor. On the contrary, a concept, according to Kaufman, cannot be the origin of metaphor. A concept is a metaphor of metaphor, but a metaphor cannot be the metaphor of a concept. This is possible only if a metaphor abides under the concept. I quote, though there, is, though there is a path that leads from wakefulness to dream, no bridge, actually Nietzsche writes no regular way, leads from dream to the world of concepts. End quotation. How so? Isn't the concept precisely that bridge? A bridge cast over the castrating woof. And we might remark that in the same page where he deciphers the spider as the castrating mother, Freud deciphered the bridge as the symbol of the penis during the cartus. So cutting the bridge might be literally castrating the concept, which is the most metaphorical of, metaphorical of metaphors, but not the least effective. It's the simple and hollow name. But if the construction needs the generalization of hollow names, paleonymy, how to deconstruct while castrating this economy? While castrating an abusive, catacrestic, as it were, inventive force. I quote Kaufman, quoting Nietzsche, Only as creators can we destroy it, exclamation mark. But let us also not forget that in the long run it is enough to create new names and valuations and appearances of truth in order to create new, create new things between brackets. End of quotation. So invention is dangerous, it produces hypostasis, fetishes. This is maybe even tragic, but what else do we have? For Kaufman, the nudity of Dionysus, or the, gest the gesture of Bo Bo, is, I quote, no, it's, this is not a quotation, the last fetish that takes away all the, fe all the fetishes, as if relieving from the concept that's relieved from life. But if, just like life, only a fetish could relieve a fetish, would this relief? by Kaufman, be assured. Is Bobo the fetish that carries out the castration of the bridge over the goof, or the haircut of Medusa? When Kaufman writes that Nietzsche's interpretation of interpretation, affirming life as such, allows man, I quote, to dépasser l'absurdité initiale tout en, course, en, course, en conservant l'innocence du devenir, one is tempted to comment, what a relief, but is this not wanting it all and too much? Is in Kaufman's last word, a laughter, she says, stronger than any nose and than any, perhaps, than any compromise, than any fetish or metaphor? Isn't this one more fetish, by definition? Isn't this good rhetoric? And as, as for the strategy of multiplication of metaphor, the wholly other space of invention that this laughter seals, are they still haunted by a desire for poverty or domination? Mm -hmm. In Camera Obscura and Mobo, these problems are maybe defined in a sharper way. And Kauf Kaufman's fetish is more clearly formalized as a graph between Nietzsche's and Freud, and therefore condemned as inverted, perverted. But in the meanwhile, metaphor oscillates. Sometimes it's the metaphysical synonym of the fetish, sometimes it is the thread to life as text. 
And this is not without consequence for the generalization of the fetish. And above all, in this text, one last twist mm, permit to maybe find mm, a last, uh, mm, last, uh, last word, the last, last, uh, last mark, which differs from an almost cathartic burst of, burst of laughter. According to Freud, I quote, Kaufman, fetishism implies both the recognition and this and disavowal of, of castration, the perception that the mother's penis is missing, and the constitution of the substitute, the fetish. Thus, the camera obscura perspective device that distillates a transparent image of the world by means of inversion is, I quote, a fetish which serves to deny the darkness of the other ch chamber. It is the substitute penis offered to the mother. So it's fetish. What happens when, like Nietzsche, one generalizes perspectivism, which is camera obscura, which is fetish? Thanks to the providential synonymy of fetish and metaphor, the generalization of fetish becomes the first phase of deconstruction. This is coherent at the price of a certain slipping, because in broader terms, our synonym of fetish, our polyamy, should have been concept. And the generalization of the fetish also is affirmed at the price, I think, of some, some inconsequence. I quote, the metaphor of the camera obscura has as a corollary that of inversion. However, if everyone, everyone has a camera obscura, this does not mean that everyone sees the world as inverted. But how so? How is a camera obscura supposed to work without inversion? In Baobab, the term, the term perversion, perversion then V equals the condemnation of fetishistic denial and of the correlate belief in castration, which is condemnates the, uh, condemns the, the duration of sexual difference. But with perversion, are, are we still beyond good and evil? In this scene, the avatopaic gesture of Babo showing her womb should disclose, this is a quotation this time, nudity as that fetish that puts an end to all fetishisms. Another quotation, to make oneself naked is to show against any future denial that there is nothing to hide. Against any future denial. Really, would ask Nietzsche quoted by, by Kaufman in another context. Isn't this a patent denegation? And is not this condemnation of perversion a condemnation of idolatry? Isn't it moralistic, religious even? Is Baobo symbol of fecundity, Coelia or Baobon? supposed to be the last symbol of all, the sign of an eternal return of life or of fecundity beyond death and suffering, says Kaufman. The sign of a, of a goddess, if not a god. Mm, Freud says that a totem is never an isolated individual, but always a class of, ob of, ob of objects. Sorry. Uh, while a fetish is a case of a most general class of all, that of singular, non-immaterial signifiers. So the, our objection to the, the, to Bob being the last fetish, taking away all, the, all, all fetishisms, would be how not to relapse onto non-immaterial idiosyncrasies, how not to erect idols. And yet, in Carol Obscura and Bob, one last twist marks the ebbing of the enthusiastic discharge of laughter. A last question, a last perhaps maybe, that resists the burst of laughter. What if ge the generalization of camera obscura were yet one more apotropeum to counter the fear of castration by Nietzsche? What if Nietzsche's femininity were yet another factitious compromise formation, an exposed fetish like mother's umbrella? So some years later, re reading Freud and Derrida, Kaufman considers directly the, hypo the hypothesis of the generalization of fetishism. Strictly speaking, fetishism cannot be generalized, because in order to guarantee a viable is issue to the castration complex, ensuring man's descent and uh, uh, ensuring the possibility of sex coupling, Freud needs to postulate the girl's being same envy and the transfer of the phantasmal maternal phallus as if castrated by the father onto the boy. This concept, as Kaufman uh, shows, is for its phrase on fetish. Yet, leaving aside Freud's biological teleology, Freud's text might host the keys to recognize a destabilizing generalization. On the one hand, we have, as, said, as, as we have said, every man's penis being, having once been the ersatz of the indecidable metonymy, which is the maternal phallus. 
And such an ersatz maybe is even uh, the wife, as described by Freud and as commented upon by Kaufman in the end of her enigma of woman, as if stiffened in a penis-like rigidity impeding her oscillation uh, and her se sexuality. Mm, and on, the other hand, on the other hand, we have, we have clothing fetishism, of course, which is a quite normal uh, perversion, according to Freud, because it, it's, the, 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 it's, the, it's the fetishism that touches half of humanity. So it takes Derrida's force to recognize the, the generalization of the, threat, of the fetish. Yet, for Kaufman, what is generalized is not the fetish as a compromise formation, but as undecidable. Compromise versus undecidable. Only the latter is the key that opens the metamorphic space of invention, which is the cradle, the origin space of literature. And where the laughter of a quasi feminine, feminine jouissance results, again, isn't this too relieving to be true? With Kaufman, we shall ask, pourquoi c'est si mal d'être fetishiste? For Kaufman, as for Freud, the fetish seems to remain a compromise which is never fully sat satisfying. You always lose with the fetish. And yet, you always win too. But the solution to our problem, the affirmation of a generalized substitution, could not be theoretical or programmatic. Rather, maybe sym symptomatic. To be looked for in facts, as it were, in the articulation of life and writing. In this sense, the opening of Rue of Daniel Rilaba is quite telling, because here Kaufman evokes father's pen a defunct fetish tied together in a scotch tape as what compels her to write, first in her mimetic fashion and finally to produce her autobiography or her recit autobiography, the exposure of this. But in this exposure, in, in these experiences of writing, what of a joyous space of invention, be it philosophical or, or, or literary, does this affirmation, or such affirmation, propel itself beyond death and suffering? Can this laughter relieve in its nudity from all fetishism? I think this is open to question. Rather than making the intolerable, to the intolerable tolerable, Kaufman's exposition seems to render the tolerable, intolerable, intol intolerable again, to expose intolerability. Not maybe the intolerability of death, but of life and of the writing of, of life. Is this possible? What if one could not avoid, partially at least, to render the intolerable tolerable again? By idealization, by fetishization, by neutralization, by communication. And what if this were precisely intolerable, so much as to make up one's own death? It's quite obscene, I, I confess, as if searching for uncloaked truth that I end on this note. Unless precisely a certain becoming legend or figure or fetish of death rendered this obscenity of mine tolerable, isn't Kaufman's case, just like Nietzsche's, a legend? But this is to me an apologue. Kaufman crafted such inscription in the other's apologue, inscripted by the other. An inscription which is doubly theatrical, knowing that suicide is impossible because death is a fetish, just like the will that would want to keep it to itself. <coughs> and because of the choice of the date, the birthday of Nietzsche, when he decided to invent his own life. Birthday, which was a festive recurrence, a national feast, to which Nietzsche owed his first names, those of Friedrich Wilhelm, like the King of Prussia, to whose, to whose late successor, the last German emperor, Nietzsche, Dionysus, and the Crucified addressed their last declaration of war, not so crazy maybe after all. Death is last apotropaean, is a proliferation of masks, almost a feast. So should one laugh at it? Let's assume that one must, since according to the date, this is an affirmation of eternal return. Then how to laugh at it? If death on a fetish date were the last fetish that took away all the fetishes, it would be a comical laughter, a proper ending after all. This would be good rhetoric, in too intentionally good. So maybe one could, could try and laugh or smile at, at the preterintentional effects of this scene. What would this scene make tolerable and tolerably? Mm, does this scene affirm survival in spite of all, fetish life? And to conclude, I dare ask, is this scene a gigantic joke 
that one shall try to laugh at. Thank you.